Panini Football 87 album. Johnston, Stark, Souness. The greatest names in soccer are captured in the Panini Football 87 album. Get it free this week in the sun. Stickers of your favorite football heroes to collect and swap. Plus Mexico's magic moments, British stars abroad, and lots more. And it's free this week only in the sun. Roles reversed on the casting couch. Read the true life confessions of the Hollywood toy boys revealed by Jackie Collins in the sun. Girls, find out how to get a body like Page 3 Beauty Maria Whitaker in The Sun. And see the new smash hit Eddie Murphy movie, The Golden Child, free. The Sun's giving away 15,000 tickets. It's all in The Sun this week. You always score with The Sun. And what about that? A man from the BBC there. Helping someone backing up. Milton Santos this time. Billy. And number three. And into the top ten we go with Justin Fashionu from 1980 for Norwich against Liverpool. Ryan Fashionu. Oh, oh, what a goal! Oh, that's a magnificent goal! At number nine, Bobby Charlton, the World Cup in 66, England versus Mexico. Nice, Charlton, Bobby Charlton, hand on the right. Maybe a shot from Charlton. Worth trying. At number eight, Mickey Walsh for Blackpool against Sunderland in 75, the goal of the season. Well taken by Walsh. Davis is on the far side. Ainsco coming square. That's the ball. That's a good try! What a goal! At number seven, the goal that won the FA Cup for Spurs back in 1981 against Villa. Manchester City and the scorer, Ricky Villa. And still Ricky Villa! What a fantastic run! He scored! At number six, the great George Best from 1970 in the League Cup, United against Chelsea. Best is up front. There he is, the defence split. Can he do it? He surely must. At number five, little Archie Gemmell in the 78 World Cup, Scotland against Holland. Gemmell. Good play by Gemmell, and again. It's a three one! At number four, the incomparable Jimmy Greaves in the league in 1965 for Spurs against Manchester United. Greaves, changing direction so well. Oh, beautiful football. What a great goal. Fabulous goal. At number three, Carlos Alberto from the World Cup final of 1970, Italy against Brazil. Oh, this is great stuff. They need to take it in turns to give an exhibition. Gazzino, number seven. Pele. Up comes Carlo Alberto on the right. And it's four! At number two, it's that man Charlton again. The FA Charity Shield in 67, United against Spurs. A long. A beautiful body swept to kick. Oh, great goal! And here it comes, the number one, top of our chart, Diego Maradona for Argentina against England in the 86 World Cup. And goal lovers, it is the second goal. He has Borchaga to his left and Valdano to his left. He doesn't, he won't need any of them. Oh, you have to say that's magnificent. There we are. I know that most of you enjoyed those, but many of you disagreed with the order, and there were plenty of letters for goals that we left out. So here now, the top ten that we left out of the top 20. And Greaves has got the whole field. He's got the whole field to himself. He'll have to beat the defender. He's got the goalkeeper now. Darren. Collins is head of that. Oh, 
Bolton in the Real half. There's David Nish. Gamble. George! Oh, I say Brecker! Rain has eased slightly, but it's still coming down. Rio. High right for Liverpool. Keegan wants to get through. Becker. Now Keegan. Neil is up on the far post, calling for a cross. McDermott. Oh, that was beautiful! Stadium coming to meet the goal kick. Goal for header. Here's Robertson. Regis taking it well on the chest and a lovely piece of control by Regis. Oh, and what a great shot! Looking to knock it forward. Picks out Dalglish and a marvellous turn inside the defender. Steps around another. Oh, and into the top corner. A stunning individual goal by Kenny Dalglish. Galvin. Brook. Huddle with a beautiful piece of skill. What a magnificent goal by Glenn Huddle. He deserves those celebrations. is going to take it. James making a near post run. And maybe a chance here. Brilliant! What a goal! It was Hughes. Who else would get a goal like that? Three. Stevens. Looking for Sharp. And he got behind Lawrence and there. It's Sharp! What a fantastic goal! What do you mean you still haven't seen your favourite goal? Well, I dare say very shortly we'll have the top five that we left out of our top 20 and our top 10. Now, we've been through the football matches that are on today. Lads enjoy all the thrills of the English Cup, but don't forget it's Scottish Cup ties up here in Scotland this weekend. The tired around, in fact, tomorrow, Aberdeen against Celtic up at Pataudry. More of that later. But today's big match, Rangers against your club, Greasy, Hamilton Ackies. Those academicals, I would have thought, are going to get a bit of a football lesson here this afternoon in front of 37,000 people at Ibrox. But the main centre of interest is in the Rangers goalkeeper, Chris Woods, the Englishman who's trying to set up a British record in a Scottish Cup tie. Woods has gone 12 matches without conceding a goal, but there's still some confusion just how many more minutes he has to keep that goal sheet clean before he beats the record. Well, a lot of people have said six minutes, and then I've been told that it's 29 minutes, so uh, I think I better aim for the first half anyway. Your manager says it's not important at all, really. What is important is just to keep a clean sheet for the whole match. That's right, that's all we do. We go out to um, keep a clean sheet, like it says, and anything on top of that is a bonus. But um, I suppose there'll be quite a few people thinking, well, hope he does it, or hope he doesn't, you know, whatever. But... Um, It'll be a, a nice milestone to pass it if I can manage it. You've obviously no regrets about coming to Scotland. In goalkeeping terms, has it been more of a challenge to you or less of a challenge than you imagined? <clears throat> um, I suppose it's been more of a challenge because when you're involved in a match, uh, um, you're up and down and sort of you, you're really sort of keyed up. But when you're not um, involved, it's a question of keeping your concentration going and probably shouting makes a big difference in, in your game and um, I just like to think that I've added that to my game whereas probably I, I, I hadn't got that before. Tomorrow Celtic take on Aberdeen at Pataudry. This is Easter Road and today of course was Scottish Cup Day. Now 20 years ago a young man called Sammy Reid scored a goal in a certain place called Berwick that on the Richter scale in terms of football was about uh, standard 10 because it sent reverberations throughout the land as Rangers the Giants crashed out of the Scottish Cup. Well, in the 70th minute today at Ibrooks, history for Rangers cruelly repeated itself as Adrian Sprott scored the only goal of the game that knocked that gigantic club out of the Scottish Cup. Now, that was a painful nostalgic note, but here, for certain people, a very pleasant one. Scotland, too, with a major shock at Ibrox, where the Premier Division's bottom club, Hamilton, put out Rangers. For the Rangers goalkeeper, Chris Woods, it was the end of a run of 13 games in which he was unbeaten.
The other big surprise was the triumph by Highland League Peter Head over Clyde. Months ago, one of the two Ibrox players to be sent off during the game has been banned from Europe for four matches. The details and the rest of today's news now from Jim White. Rangers got the news in the last hour. UEFA has fined the club 12,000 Swiss francs, that's just over £5,000, after considering the report of Belgian referee Alex Pony. During the game, two Rangers players were sent off, defender Stuart Monroe and winger Davy Cooper. Monroe has been banned for four games in Europe for, in the words of a UEFA spokesman tonight, displaying violent conduct against an opponent. Cooper's case is still to be heard at the next UEFA disciplinary committee meeting. And for their part, Borussia Mönchengladbach were fined 5,000 Swiss francs. That's about £2,000. Rangers will decide tomorrow whether or not to appeal. In a moment, the views of Scottish Daily Express sports writer Jerry McNee match in Germany. But if Rangers supporters are upset about the treatment of their club tonight, Celtic fans are feeling aggrieved on an entirely different issue. The Parkhead faithful are annoyed with the SFA for taking the club's third Scottish Cup replay against Aberdeen to Dens Park, Dundee, on Monday night. The Celtic Supporters Association says many more than the ticket-holding 11,000 Celtic fans will travel to Dundee in an effort to get in to see the game. Association General Secretary George Delaney told me the problems he foresees. Well, the first, the first problem is segregation. You know, normally the, the away team is packed into a little section of the, the ground at uh, Dens Park. And we foresee that Aberdeen won't sell their 11,000 tickets. They very seldom get 11,000 going to any game with Aberdeen away from home. So you're going to get a situation where there will be tickets available and Celtic supporters will snap them up and they will be mingling with the Aberdeen supporters. The only logical place to play this game with the amount of people that want to see it is Hamden. There's no doubt about it. But could you really have expected Aberdeen fans to travel back down to Glasgow in, in, inside a, a week? You know, there's a fa fallacy about this problem of travelling. We had Celtic supporters travelling from Luton, all over England, Ireland, and, and far further than the Aberdeen supporters on, on the last game, and in every game, in, in, in fact. So th this is a fallacy about, about Aberdeen. But surely even then, they could have subsidised the Aberdeen supporters' buses in su some fashion from the gate, if that was the problem. Well, Jeremy McNee, first of all, on the Rangers issue, what's your view of the £5,000 fine? Well, it's typical of UEFA. That's a slap in the wrist. I mean, Rangers take more than a in from a pie stall on a Saturday afternoon. That won't bother them one bit. But I think the, the situation with the players will worry them. Yes, how serious, Jerry, is the European ban on Stuart Monroe? I think it's very serious. I think UEFA have overreacted. Uh, it, it's ridiculous, in fact. I was at the match. I saw what happened. And this is a young player we've got to remember. And they really should have taken that into consideration. But, of course, the clubs aren't allowed to go to these uh, appeals in Zurich. I was at one a couple of years ago when Celtic were involved after the Rapid Vienna experience, and they just don't listen to the clubs. I think they've reacted terribly in this situation. It's, it's a tragedy for the young player because Rangers are in Europe uh, next season, as we know, because they've already won the Skull League Cup. If they get into the Champions Cup, for instance, where there are only two early rounds, it means that player cannot play till the quarterfinals. Was it your view on the night, Jerry, that Rangers players were provoked? No, I, I think it was a bad-tempered match, as we said at the start there. Uh, there were one or two unsavoury moments in it, let's not beat about the bush there, but I think the referee had a bad match. I think the fact the referee phoned UEFA first thing the next morning proves that. Jerry, let's turn to this Celtic <coughs> Aberdeen replay. I actually said earlier it was a third replay, it's a second replay, isn't it? Should the, the match on Monday be staged at Dens Park? Yes, I think that's a fair and just decision for the Aberdeen supporters. Now, I was listening to George there, and he was looking through his green spectacles, no doubt about that. He's a great fella, George. I've known him for years. He wants the best deal for his own fans. I don't blame him for that. Rangers and Celtic are important to Scottish football, and so are their supporters, but there are other clubs to be taken into consideration. But, Jerry, statistically, doesn't George Delaney's argument make sense? 55,000 watched the match at Parkhead the other night. Only 22,000 will watch the match at Dent. It's sad that uh, some 40,000 people will be locked out of a football match. There are ways around this, and I have certain theories on it. I think, for instance, there should be a penalty shootout in the Scottish Cup, certainly after the second game. And here's possibly a case uh, where this game should have been moved to a separate night and shown live on television so as that these people can see it. It's important to keep the, the supporters involved. This is maybe one way around it, but I think a penalty shootout must come in the Scottish Cup. Do you foresee the problems that George Delaney was talking about possibly on Monday night, Jerry? Do you think there'll be a, a mass arrival of Celtic fans trying to get in? Well, I hope not. Uh, I think people are sensible enough now, and I think the Dundee police know how to, to handle these situations. They've got two grounds there and the one street in, in Tanadai Street. 
and uh, they'll be watching the situation very carefully. I would appeal to all fans who don't have a ticket, stay away, listen to it on the radio, and you'll be kept informed in other ways. And briefly, Jerry, your message is scrub the replays, let's have penalties. I think so. It's good enough for the World Cup final now. They play one game and extra time. Same for the European Champions Cup final. It should be good enough for the Scottish Cup. Jerry McNee, thank you. And now a brief look at the matches in prospect tomorrow. And there's a Premier League card. Leaders Celtic stay home to Alex Smith St. Mirren, travel to Tyne Castle to face Hearts, and that one has been a sellout for weeks. Dundee United play Falkers. Hearts match marks a milestone for a man who's played for both the Tyne Castle side and Rangers. Sandy Jardin, though he won't be playing, will be celebrating no less than 20 years in top flight football. He made his Rangers first team debut way back in 1967, and today in a Hearts jersey, he still displays great touches of skill at the back. In his days at Ibrox, he was known to find the net too. Jardin winning that back. Jardin coming through. Chips it in. And it's a great goal by Jardin. Great goal by Jardin. And I would say that's just about it. 32 minutes. 4-2 for Rangers. Jardin coming through, chips it in, and it's a great goal by Jardin. Great goal by Jardin. And I would say that's just about it. 32 minutes, 4-2 for Rangers. Age hasn't changed the outlook of Sandy Jardin. Today, just as in 1974, Sandy still lives for football. Now co-manager of Hearts, at 38 years of age, he celebrates 20 years of playing top-level football in Scotland. He can't fully celebrate his 20-year anniversary as injury has ruled him out of tomorrow's match against Rangers. So today, he took time to reflect on his first senior game those 20 years ago. I remember uh, just after Berwick, it was, which had been a bit of a disaster for Rangers. Uh, there was a big crowd at Ibrox that day, playing Hearts, and uh, we eventually won 5-1, but Hart scored the first goal and uh, it did put us under a bit of pressure for a wee while. <laughs> Tell me, Sandy, over the years, over the 20 years, you've played, what, a thousand or so senior, senior games. What differences do you see in the game today? Uh, obviously, the game's a lot, lot, lot quicker. Uh, the players are a lot faster. There definitely is more thought put in the game. Uh, when I first started, basically, 4-2-4 was just starting. Uh, now there's uh, so many other variations with sweepers and uh, things like that. But there's been a big advance in the game. 38. Do you sometimes feel you're 38 years when you're in the middle of a torrid Premier League game? No, no, I just feel I feel 48 after it. But <laughs> during the game, I'm OK. How long, Sandy, will you keep playing? I don't know. It's something that everybody keeps asking me. I'll play as long as I, as I can and as long as I enjoy it. Uh, to be honest, I've never thought I'd be playing Premier League football at 38, but uh, I'll just take it one season at a time. The ageless Sandy Jardin. Meanwhile, in the first division, injury hit leaders... Borussia Mönchengladbach last September. Stuart Munro has been banned by UEFA for four European games, but winger Davy Cooper's case won't be heard until the next meeting of the disciplinary committee. The incidents occurred as Rangers went out of the UEFA Cup on the away goals rule in a nil-nil draw in Germany. After Monroe was sent off, Rangers were reduced to nine men when Cooper appeared to argue with the referee. The German side were fined just over £2,000 for their part in the match. The programme where we'll be featuring the highest scoring league match in Britain this weekend, Hearts against Rangers from Tynecastle <coughs> Park, Edinburgh, plus ITV's... Big so, Rangers bounce back and Hearts have to worry about that cup replay at Kilmarnock tomorrow in the game. This great year for Scottish football, another capacity crowd. Well, what I asked at the start of the programme had Mick McGahey, Sean Connery and Kenny Dalgleish all have in common. Go to the top of the class if you got that right. 
They all played junior football. For the record, Mr. McGackie was a keeper for the Vale of Clyde, a row seven, a winger for Bonnie Rig Rose, and Kenny was farmed out to Cumbernauld United in his early Celtic days. The juniors conjure up lovely pictures of tiny grounds, hard players, committed crowds. They also have lovely names, Stonehouse Violet, Kirk and Tillich, Rob Roy, Dundonald Bluebell. Well, the juniors, from Aberdeen Bonacore to Yoker Athletic, are alive and well and celebrating their 100th birthday. And that's been marked by a book whose title might come straight to the point, The Juniors 100 Years. Co-author David McGlone is in the studio to guide us through the life and times of Scotland's other football association. The juniors, to my mind, provide football in the raw. All thrills, no thrills. They were the breeding ground for generations of players who went on to win Scotland caps. They have been the last resting place of famous footballers who couldn't bear to give up the game when their best days were over. What, I wonder, would we have done without them? The Scottish Junior Cup, by far and away the most impressive sporting trophy in the country, can still attract large crowds, envied by the smaller of the senior clubs. Every year, the Junior Cup final brings together people from all over Scotland, and in recent seasons, Scott Sports has been more than happy to provide live coverage and will be more than well rewarded. Still going 30 is on. Jibber couldn't hold it. Forcing his way through, thinks about a shot, lets one go, and it's a good one. Spinning loose, a chance for Cunningham, and it's a goal! Tip for they should make it three. And he does. Lovely putting it in. Harvey moving in. Fighting it through, in comes Doherty, far side out in front, Flynn scores! He's there! It's a long one into the box. Ball is spinning about, not cleared. Chance for McKim and a goal! McKim scores, 2-2! Pollock uh, certainly the side to have settled quickest, and there's the opening goal. Tremendous goal from Fulton. Both sides, I'm sure, looking for a little flash of inspiration from one of the forward players. It's on the game, there's McGurk. And that's a great goal for Blantyre Vicks! has great close control on that right foot battle. He flighting it across, there comes Riley. Beautifully finished. Got Sinnott on the outside, fairly trying to avoid going offside. Shields may go all the way himself, like Shields. The rugby tackle doesn't pay off, and a marvellous goal from Shields. That's for Daly, it's away from Ault. That's a magnificent goal from Peter Hill. it's Andy Daly. He kept the ball in play, he's promising now for Talbot, they're queuing up in the middle for the cross, there's O'Donnell. McDonald does it. David, there are people in Scotland who say, I'm a junior man. Never go and watch senior football, but they're committed junior people. What's the attraction of the game? I think the attraction is that they can become perhaps more involved at their own local junior club than they could at their nearest senior club. And we don't have enough. no love loss when Scotland take on the Republic of Ireland at Hamden on Wednesday night in the European Championships. Now Martin Tyler has found a Scot with an unusual interest in the match. The match at Hamden on Wednesday is going to be the most important match for us in the European Championship. We've got to win to stand a realistic chance of qualifying. The accent is certainly Scottish, and the sentiments apply to Scotland. But this Glaswegian is talking about the Republic of Ireland, and he'll be wearing a green shirt, as he did against his native countryman last October. Ray Houghton of Oxford United, eligible because of an Irish father after being rejected by Scotland. When I was about 17, John Lyle, uh, the West Ham manager, sent me to youth trials for Scotland, and uh, actually the manager is now the Scotland manager. Andy Roxburgh. Andy Roxburgh, yes. But uh, things didn't go well for me there. Uh, one thing and another, I didn't get selected. And uh, at the time, I was pretty upset about it because uh, obviously I wanted to play for my country. I mean, do you regard yourself now as a Scottish person or as an Irish person? Well, I'm still Scottish, you know. That's where I was born, and obviously that's the, the team I, you know, as a person I, I like to think of myself as Scottish. But playing for Ireland is now my main concern, and uh, playing Scotland on Wednesday. I've got to play well for Ireland, if selected, of course. 
and uh, hopefully get the right result, result against Scotland. It was playing well at Wembley in last year's Milk Cup final when Ray Houghton really caught the eye. Beautiful piece of running by Trevor Hebert. He's got Aldridge waiting in the middle. He's got Houghton! A Wembley triumph, and now his first visit as a player to Hampden Park, where he used to watch Scotland as a boy. And he'll be facing a Scottish midfield without Graham Souness. Well, I've seen Graham play many times for Liverpool, and now he's playing for Rangers. He's a great player. Scotland will obviously miss him, but uh, we've got to go out and, and, and overpower their midfield and uh, just get in behind them and get some crosses in for Frank and John Aldridge. Anyone who looks at the Irish team on paper through the years will, will see that they've had a great squad of players with, great, with some of the best players in it. But they've always, well I've always noticed that they've always had hard groups and uh, this, this group is no exception. You've got the Belgians who come fourth in, in the uh, World Cup, Bulgaria and Scotland, so it's a hard group. Um, but we, we're quite confident that we can do well and hopefully we'll qualify. And how do you think your family are going to react on Wednesday night? Oh, I'd hate to imagine what my brothers will be like if, if Ireland wins. I hope they'll be hoping for a draw and, and uh, maybe I, I score a goal. Well, did you know, James, that uh, Ray Hunt was uh, rejected by Andy Roxburgh as a 17-year-old when uh, Andy was in charge of the years? That's very interesting, so, isn't it? Might come back and haunt us. Could be revenge time. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at the league table, James. Yes. And, uh, I mean, it is a vital game for Scotland. We keep it saying is. that, but, uh, you know, we must win this one. That is for sure. Now, the Scots... <laughs> <laughs> you've got me panicking. The Scots have, in their lineup, you could say they're equivalent to uh, Clive Allen and Brian McClare. Yeah. You know, McClare scored, scored goals, 20, yeah, 29 yes. goals, Jim, which is a lot of goals. That's and, a lot uh, of goals. Good you know, that. Yeah. And I think possibly they should play him. And Mo Johnson, you know, you've got the Celtic partnership there. Well, again, Ian, I don't see why not. The, the partnership's well. going well, it's working, they're both scoring goals. Let them have a go at it. I mean, and goals are at a premium for you jockos, isn't it? That's right. This, this is gets a... through well. He hits the post here, doesn't he? That yeah. was against Luxembourg. That's right. The last time he played him. Yes, as I say, a pretty rare sight, jocko goals. So let's hope they can let's... knock a couple for you. OK, right. So is an, an important one for Scotland at Hamden. And for the well... A fair old drubbing for hearts, and it cost them their unbeaten record at Tyne Castle, which had stretched back 21 months. It's hard for them today as well because they meet Celtic at Parkhead. Celtic, you know, they're top of the league and they're still in the cup. And despite all the publicity given to Rangers, they really could do the treble. Celtic got into the next round of the cup by beating Aberdeen at long last on Monday. After 300 minutes of football, they were through. And it was Paul McStay's pass to Brian McClare that won them a place in the next round. But really, Greasy, the reason I'm at Hampden Park is because of these goalposts behind me. Now, you know how the Scots like goalposts. In 1977, we acquired the Wembley ones. And now there's a chance for some lucky person to get hold of these posts, because what they're doing is replacing them with new ones. So these are going to be auctioned. They reckon they'll cost about £6,000, and Rod Stewart already says he wants them. Well, it did dawn on me, you're earning so much money, I mean, 6,000 quid is just small change to you. Why don't you buy them and put them in your own back garden? Because I've been looking at the record books and I don't think you ever scored a goal here. So maybe you could pretend you were scoring against the Scots in your own backyard. Ooh, nasty tackle. I, I, I only ever played for England once at Hampden and it's true I didn't score. But, Mike, <laughs> I scored two goals there against Celtic once. Uh, one with the first kick of the game yeah. and I think I scored either end same. So, so actually Archer did, is wrong. I actually did notch in those goalposts, but since they haven't yeah. been used a lot, I'll bid 20 <laughs> quid for them. All right. Now, while you were flying off to sunny claims, Jim, yes, you sir. missed the great Aki's I, cup I, win. I, I was... These are the pictures. We don't have moving pictures, obviously. But but these are the pictures from the Sunday night. I know the British Airways Ackies Supporters Club told me that we'd won one nil, and there we are. I said I'd show that, and, and that's a great sight. So, well done, the Ackies. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget... Sides were involved in international football, but three friendlies and an important European Championship game coming up next week. Let's start with Scotland's Group 7 game against the Republic of Ireland at Hampden. Of the six games so far played in this group, four have been drawn, and four of the five countries are still unbeaten. But Scotland's boss, Andy Roxburgh, knows only too well that only the group winners qualify for the finals. Archie McPherson's been talking to the Scottish manager. So has Kenny Dalgleish played his last game for Scotland? Well, of course, anything's possible, but I think if you dismiss Kenny Dalgleish, you do it at your peril. Um, 
while he's still playing, and I certainly don't discount him. Uh, he wouldn't let me discount him. <laughs> now, Graham Sunut hasn't been picked for this game. Can I ask you frankly, has he turned down the offer of playing for Scotland? No, well, obviously, I pick the team and uh, I make the offer to other people. Uh, you can't turn down something that you weren't offered. Graham Sunus and I only had discussions. Now, in case anyone starts to think there's any kind of hassle between us, there's anything but, he's extremely cooperative, 100% support to Scotland. But he has a difficult task, he has two difficult tasks. He remains a star player, he's also the manager of Glasgow Rangers. We were discussing the possibility of him taking on a third task, in other words, with the Scottish team. And after our long discussions, I decided that it maybe was asking too much and it would not be appropriate for either of us. It's also been suggested by some folk that uh, Graham Sunnis might be taking his revenge in some kind of way, having been dropped and being disappointed in being dropped for the last World Cup game in Mexico. Oh, no, no, I don't see anything like that. As I said to you, Graham's attitude towards Scotland has always been magnificent. He's been one of our greatest players in the last decade. And, uh, you know, I think it's terrible and we should even suggest otherwise. Uh, he remains, as I said, very supportive to our cause and he will help us in any way he can. At the moment, it's not appropriate because of the two major tasks that he has to add a third one. A difficult problem, really, for Andy Roxburgh, isn't it? With two great players and experienced players there available to him. And really, his problem is scoring goals at the moment from Scotland's point of view. And Graham Sunes, a creator, and Kenny Dalglish as well creates and finishes. And it is a problem because I mean, they've drawn at home to Bulgaria. They, they only got three goals, I say only, but mm. uh, against Luxembourg, I think he would have been hoping for more. And then drew nearly in the Republic of Ireland. And this is a game he must win at home. And I think they need a good win to sort of get the fans on their side as well. But Belgium uh, are the favourites, I guess, from that group, Trevor, aren't they? Yes. I mean, although the Republic went there and got a draw, yeah. it, it's, it's really a group where they're going to pick up points but I mean your home games you you do really need to win and and this one next week is very important. Andy Roxborough's got to I mean he's got to win games because there's uh, still people up there saying well you know Andy who really uh, yes. I mean they'd really like names like Billy McNeil or Kenny or Graham yes. Sooners perhaps as a manager it's difficult for Andy Roxborough who's done so much good work. Well he's got to get the right combination up front I mean they're talking about Brian McClare and Mo Johnson the Celtic duo to play up there of course uh, you know I mean people such as Graham Shaw, Frank McAvenny who's Scored, Ali McCoy scored in, in their league football, haven't been able to switch to international football and put the ball in the net. They may say that perhaps in midfield there's not that great creator who's going to sort of, look, not, well, we're not looking for a platini, but somebody who's going to create the chances. They've got David Cooper and Pat Nevin out wide who are, who are good wingers, but it's probably the midfield and the striker area that is the main problem. Yeah. Well, it's Swansea the, that stages the Welsh-Soviet Union friendly. Football, and in this astonishing season, there was another all-ticket, near-capacity crowd in Scotland again yesterday. That was at Love Street, and no... Call up to the Scotland squad today in place of Graham Sharp. And we'll have the latest news from the Scotland camp in our news desk later on. It's three months since Scotland's last international, with 3 nil win over Luxembourg, but the stakes could scarcely be higher on Wednesday night at Hamden. Victory would provide a giant step towards the European Championship finals for both Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. So, with the waiting almost over, I had a word earlier in the week with the men guiding the teams, Andy Roxborough and Jack Charlton. Jack and Andy, the long period of anticipation and preparation is almost over. Uh, is there a feeling of tension now developing? Well, it's obviously a crucial match, and uh, I know from our point of view, we can't wait to get started. Jack, one for you to look forward to, you've had a long time to wait. Yeah, it's been a long time between games, but uh, preparation is necessary. It's given us an opportunity to have a look at a few Scottish players, and uh, really we went abroad and saw the Belgians play and the, and the Bulgarians. So we've, we've not wasted our time. And uh, yeah, the anticipation is coming up, big games, it's going to be a full house, a lot of people coming from Ireland, It'll be, uh, it's going to be a cracker, I hope. I think so, I'm sure it will be, but Andy, for you, perhaps even more pressure, playing at Hamden, uh, a lot of people looking for thing, big things from the Scottish team, how do you feel about that, for the extra pressure that applies? Mm -hmm. Well, every game's a pressure, obviously, but this is a crunch match in the group, and in some ways the pressure's more on the Irish, I mean, we got the point away from home, in Dublin, and obviously Jack will be looking to do at least that, if not more, in this game, so yeah, there's pressure on all of us to, to do something in the group, one of us has to stay in contention, you know, particularly with the Bulgarians and the, and the Belgians. So it's a very, very important match to both of us. Normally, Jack, I think you would be saying at the start of the tournament that uh, playing at Hamden, you'd be happy with a point. Is that still your position? No, I've seen Scotland pay. <laughs> <laughs>
we, if we get a result out of this one, and we get a result when we go to Bulgaria, I'll be quite happy because that'll leave us four, three out of the last four matches to play in Dublin. And I would think we're in with a fair chance of qualifying then. But we need to take two points out of the two games. That's the way I look at it anyway. Because this is still going to be a very, very tight group. There's nobody can, can actually say we'll beat them on the day. It's, it just isn't that type of group, apart from probably Luxembourg are the, the ones down at the bottom out of the way. But certainly uh, it's a very well-balanced group. We're as good as Belgium. They're as good as Belgium. B Bulgaria is as good as both of us. We're better than each other on the day. And uh, I think it would be a brave man who, who said who will actually qualify out of this group. Now, there are obviously particularly important aspects to the game. Do you see any aspect in particular as, as vital to the outcome of the match at the end of the day? Well, I mean, I think both teams, uh, well, hopefully are well organised. Uh, we've got good players on each side, uh, strong defences in particular. And I think it really comes down to the finishing in this one. I mean, just on the day, you know, which set of strikers produce the goods? Jack, you see it the same way? Well, we, we, we probably made a lot more chances in Scotland when we played them in Dublin. Uh, Scotland didn't really make any chances at all. I expect it to be the other way around. We will make chances. The way we play dictates we will make chances. We'll get the ball in the box and we'll make chances. Whether we take them, whether Scotland take them, uh, on the day, we'll, we'll de de it'll be a very close game, very hardly hard com competitive game, because the one thing about the Irish, we are competitive, and they'll compete, and it'll be a very difficult game for Scotland to win, and a very difficult game for us to win, and all we can hope is that the spectators and the people who look at it uh, see a cracking game. A fine match and a Scotland win. That'll do for me. Maybe we don't have an awful lot of goals to show you from Hamden Park, Jim. Oh, we did say last that. week, of course, that you know I was half expecting this, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, and, and well done the Republic. I thought yeah. they played very well. Yeah. Although here, Jim, the foul was committed there. Yeah. The referee gave a foul, and you'll see that you know eventually when we get the picture, yeah. it was taken from ten yards away, and Big Lawrence and ran through and stuck it in the Mind net. Mind you, it's the old cardinal sin of any defender, isn't it? They've got to get on that ball in and make sure that free kicks are not taken quickly. But um, I do sympathise yeah. with you a bit. It was taken a bit away from the foul. Well, but I, unless you score goals. Well, I don't have. I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for our strikers. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter who we play up there, and we've got a list of them. I mean, you could take Macavaney, Nicholas, all strikers, Sharp, yeah. and stick yeah. them all in there. But we don't have any midfield. We no. have nobody really to back them up, you know, and other teams are doing this, yeah. you know. But anyway, well, you know, you, the, now there's Wales, for instance. Now, Wales have got two strikers, real international yeah. class. I mean, Ian Rice, one of the best in the world. Yeah. And, but he didn't score the other night. Mark no, Hughes he... did score, but no, I think that was a yeah, foul. Yeah, it was a foul, yeah. that was. Uh, it was a good challenge by Hughes, if you can get away with it. But it was a foul, there's no question about that. But you see, Jim, it doesn't matter who you've got up the front. No, it you've got to have a it good doesn't. backup to create chances That's for strikers. Right. That's right. You know, well, and yeah. Well, don't don't we all know it? I mean, we've all played in front of bad sides, and we know how difficult court it can be. Uh, there's the Hughes incident again. You can see. I mean, he uses his weight, and right. he does very well. But it was a foul, unfortunately. Yeah. For the well, well the, the Republic of Ireland uh, had a friendly match over in uh, Israel. Northern Ireland, yeah. Oh, sorry, I've uh, yeah. still got that Republic on the Yeah, Belgium, you yeah. have, haven't you? They've done you <laughs> up, haven't they, the Republic? Yeah, the Repu yeah. But they're up in Scotland, James, mm. uh, obviously the big game of the day is, is Hearts versus Celtic. Celtic you know, yes, and they, they met yes. last week, and everybody said to me up in Scotland that they thought Hearts were a little bit unlucky, you know, yeah, to, yeah. to only get a draw there. Yeah. But I think the big game of the day is the, Aki's versus the, Motherwell. The real big game of the day is your team <laughs> against mine. There you are. They beat Rangers, didn't they? EDO, ADO, the English route. And I'll tell you what, saying, tenner? Fancy a tenner? Wait, you want... I'll take the Aki's, you take Motherwell. Come on, they're your side. You've played for them, you've been manager. And I'm only a president, a vice president of Aki's, so, you know, it's got to be a tenner. Twenty. Tenor. Tell, well, I'll tell you, uh, the, the reason, I'm, the reason I'm, I'm, like, a little bit frightened of it is because the Aki's knocked out Rangers, obviously. Yeah. They must be a super yeah. team. Yeah, they are uh, super uh, team. A local derby. But, yeah. yes, I'll go along with that. I'll go so and take... But, mind you, I've skinned up a bit of Scotland during the week. You see, the thing is there is... The, the secret is in Aki's pitch, isn't it? I mean, you and I have walked on it, and we yes. went to the centre circle yeah. and got stuck in the mud. We couldn't get <laughs> back off. We had to get a bulldozer. <laughs> and that's what's going to happen today, okay. and no. I think that they'll win. Well, come on the well, that's what I will say to him. You Aki's! <laughs> right, well, that's it for this week. Don't forget the Duloc Snooker. All night for the Scots, outfought and outthought by the Republic of Ireland in their European Championship qualifier.
bit of a sandwich and it's quickly taken. That's a goal. Lawrenson. Oh yes, a thoroughly deserved victory for the Irish and what made it even more ironical is that one of the best players was Glasgow born and bred Ray Houghton who doesn't even know how to say Begora. And frankly, I think Scotland have as much chance of qualifying now as getting Liam Brady to play for us. Meanwhile, the Scottish Cup and at the top of the list and the United playing away from home against Spreaking, whose entire ground and staff are probably valued less than Gary Lineker, whom Dundee United face in just over a week's time in the UEFA Cup. Ked men really are to get their confidence back. A win there for them tomorrow is vital. Hearts and St Mirren meet at Tynecastle, and that could even be a cup final rehearsal. Motherwell meet Falkirk, and Hibbs travel to Ibrox to face Rangers. Now, Motherwell can... Peter Graham soon has said today he did make an inquiry about Oxford's Ray Houghton, but not a bid. Oxford said on Monday this week that the player wasn't available and Sunas says Rangers may or may not go back. Right now, it was too early to say. Now, what about the changing fortunes of that now famous Highland League side, Peter Head? A very good evening to you and welcome to Ibrox Park. On the 1st of March, 1986, Rangers played Hibs here at the stadium in front of a crowd of just over 16,500. Today, almost exactly a year later, they played in front of a crowd of 38,412. My arithmetic's right, that's in the region of 22,000 more. And if you convert that into money, it's about 100,000 pounds. That is why what has happened uh, this season at Ibrox Park has transformed not just the stadium, but the whole of Scottish football. And when you get a crowd of that really mean business, I'll say again what I said when Graham Sinnott arrived here, that they want to put Rangers back on the European map, and they will sign a one-eyed, hot and taut transvestite if he can play well. And if some people think that signing a man of a religious persuasion would be even worse than that, then I think they're deluding themselves. And if a signing like that would leave empty seats in his marvelous stadium, they'll simply be filled by people whom Rangers want to see, coming to see only good football. From all of us here, good night. Did you hear him? He says, Rangers have signed a player for Japan. I said, have they? He said, I can you whack an Aki. <laughs> I'll tell you. Oh. There was a distinct smell of money in the air when Terry Butcher arrived at Ibrox. The Glasgow club outbid the cream of the English First Division for the former Ipswich captain. Spurs, Arsenal, Chelsea, Everton, none could match the record signing fee of almost three quarters of a million pounds. But while Rangers wanted Butcher, the Glasgow club wasn't his first choice. No, I must be honest and say that it wouldn't have been. Um, I think uh, I was given a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a nod, really, that Manchester United were interested. I, I think they'd watched me for about two years anyway. So I knew, I knew of their interest and um, I was told that they would be making a bid. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately now, but um, unfortunately for Big Ron Atkinson, um, the money wasn't there, so he couldn't make a bid. Um, I think every English boy wants to play for Manchester United. I think it's his ultimate dream. So I think if they'd have come in with a big bid, which was accepted, then I think I would have gone there. But, um, you know, if I'd, have, if I'd knew then what I know now, then I'd definitely come to Rangers first. When um, I got the job towards the end of last season, and he was number one target, him and Richard Goff. Um, Richard Goff, we felt we could have got cheaper at the time. As it turned out, we couldn't get him at any price. Terry, when we couldn't get Richard, there was only one person we wanted. He's better than what I thought he was, and I'm absolutely delighted that he's a Rangers player. He, he's not only a great player, but he's also a very, very um, good professional. And I felt, not just in a Scottish game, but maybe in a British game, Professional footballers don't treat the, the profession as serious as they should do. And maybe I was guilty of that in my earlier years as well. But I'd done a wee bit of homework on Terry, asked a few people who knew him. Terry, I feel, has brought something to Glasgow Rangers which I haven't had for a long time. It's a bit of integrity and off the field, he's a perfect Rangers captain. For Butcher, the move came at a good time. Ipswich Town, the club he'd been with for more than a decade, had been relegated. With the arrival of Graham Souness, Rangers were on the way up. And after just one meeting with the new manager, Butcher never returned to Ipswich. His knowledge of Souness was confined to his reputation on the field. Both men played and scored when England defeated Scotland in the Rouse Trophy at Wembley in the spring of 1986. Butcher. One to England. With his wife Rita and two small boys, the Butcher family settled in a house in Bridge of Allen. 
But for the six foot four defender who'd always lived within kicking distance of his club, the first few weeks were a difficult time. The football was different too, and Butcher took some time to adjust to the Scottish game. I was off form in a way because uh, I'm still not playing to the form that I'd like anyway now. But uh, um, I think when you first start with the club, I sign on the Friday and then made my debut on the Tuesday against Bayern Munich and then we're straight into the league. Um, obviously, you all know about the Hibs game. Um, that's history now. And then we won the United here, so we had a, a wretched start by all accounts and everybody was tipping us to do this and do that. So it took time for the squad to get together and get to know each other. And um, it took a while for us to, to get going. Obviously, culminated in the Skull Cup final. That was, that was a great boost for us. But um, it was hard early on and uh, different uh, league, different systems, different players, different grounds, of course. Um, the referees are perhaps a little bit stricter up here, I would say. I've, I've been booked perhaps more than I would down south. The actual game is probably a little bit quicker. It's a bit more end-to-end. -end. Uh, in England, probably is a little bit more control, but there's not much of a difference at all. Supporters up here are certainly different anyway, especially the Rangers supporters. I mean, you know, they are fantastic. There's quite a few jokes about the English now up here, which is quite good. And there's so much dressing room banter and talk. It's, it's tremendous now. You have a little five size England versus Scotland, and England versus the rest of the world and all this. It's quite good. Last year's World Cup was the start of a real high in Butcher's career. After playing in Mexico, he joined Rangers, won the Skull Cup, and within weeks captained his country for the first time when England met Yugoslavia in a European qualifying match last November. And it was a, a double boost for Rangers, really, that I was made captain, and Chris was uh, in goal. So, and luckily for us, uh, we had a, a very good victory. Um, a bit lucky, some people might say, but we still won, and obviously now quite firm favourites to go through. But. It was a great experience for me and I think, you know, it's, a, it's an ambition of every, every little boy who, who wants to captain his country and I've done that now, so I shan't retire yet, but in a few years' time. <laughs> Retirement is the last thing on his mind with three and a half years of his contract with Rangers to go. After that, Butcher is considering the minefield of management and he says only a good player manager's job would entice him from the Glasgow club. Now that the homesickness is past, the Butcher family are enjoying life in Scotland. In quiet Bridge of Allen, away from thoughts of the championship race, Terry plays the family man. The children are fast developing Scottish accents. And at his new school, four-year-old Christopher never lets anyone forget his father is a star. It's a bit embarrassing, really, because you meet some of the parents and they come back and say, uh, you know, my, your, your son's uh, told my son that, you know, what a great footballer you are and you know, my dad's Terry Butcher and all this. But uh, he's, he's still speaking broad Suffolk, so... Uh, Christopher calls uh, Edward uh, the wee man. That's uh, quite common. And I'm saying I all the time instead of yes. I've got a four-year contract, so we'll, if, I, if they pick it up in four years, I'll be surprised. Every time I come home and he asks me how we got on, and I didn't say one, two nil or three nil or whatever, and he, he said, did you score, Daddy? And I said, no. Said, Why not? And he bursts into tears or hits me or beats me up or something. Just to say, why didn't you score? I said, well, it's not my job, son. I feel embarrassed when I come away, but uh, I'll try, I'm trying to score, Stan, I'm trying to score. <laughs> They're all the same, these kids, aren't they? Sally McNair talking to Terry Butcher. Good evening to you and welcome to Ibrooks Park. You know, it's been this kind of season in which if you scored a goal against Rangers here at Ibrooks, there's a chance you would end up in the record books. A man called Adrian Sprott did exactly that. However, there is another very significant goal scorer against Rangers this season. And that was way back on the 8th of November when a gentleman called Ray Farnham scored a goal late on in the game. And that was the last defeat Rangers had to be withdrawn from the Scottish Bowl for Wednesday night in the important game against Belgium. We wish Andy Roxburgh and all the Scottish players the very best of luck for that very important game. And talking about international class, we saw it today in one particular save by a goalkeeper who I'm sure must have been feeling very chilly in a windy eyebrows. He had hardly anything to do. And Chris Woods proving that even if you are in that position, when you're called upon with a challenge, you meet it squarely on. From all of us at eyebrows, good night. Roberts goes up, drives that in. Well, there's a great save! Woods! and Roy Aiken will be giving their thoughts on tomorrow's Premier League decider shortly. But first tonight, an England-Scotland clash of a different kind at Twickenham to Parkhead tomorrow for the, season's old, for the season's last old firm clash. The police feared terracing trouble after the revelation that a number of Rangers fans have bought tickets for Celtic areas of the ground. A police spokesman said today that anyone entering the Celtic end and donning Rangers colours would be immediately removed from the ground. 
Well, let's hope common sense prevails off the field. Meanwhile, on it, Rangers realistically need only avoid defeat to win the First League Championship for nine years. They are four points clear at the top and would gladly settle for a repeat of their last visit to Parkhead. Taking a grip the midfield. Paul McStay very much at the heart of it all. Now McGee. Here's McLear. He's touched it past Woods. These are always providing the width on the right for Rangers going forwards. Durant to Fleck. Good turn with the striker. There's the chance. McCoyce. Rangers are back on level terms. Rangers captain Terry Butcher has yet to finish on the losing side in an old firm match, and he expects tomorrow to be no different. No, I think with the amount of uh, support we'll take and the uh, public and, and uh, media interest in the game, I think if we went there trying to get a draw, I think we'll get uh, slaughtered by our own fans anyway. So uh, we've got to uh, be positive. We've got to go there with an open attacking mind uh, and go there to win. I think it's as simple as that. We know what's at stake. Celtic know what's at stake. So hopefully it'll be a cracking match. I think we've got players in there who can cope with the best. Paul McStay, Peter Grant, Mother McClure, whoever really plays in there. We've got the players that can handle that, and we're really looking to play ourselves rather than worry about what Rangers do. Which side do you think tomorrow really is under the great, greater psychological pressure, yourself or Rangers? Um, I think both teams at this stage in the season, only six games left, and both teams are going for the Championship. Um, I don't know if anybody's under any more stress than anybody else. I know Firm game is a one-off situation. Both teams are under stress in this situation. But uh, we know exactly what we've got to do, and we're going out to do it. Jerry McNee, a very positive Roy Aitken. If you were a Celtic fan, would you share his optimism? No, I wouldn't, because I think the Celtic defence has been a great source of their problems this season. But this will be a tribal gathering, which will certainly have everyone going tomorrow afternoon. It's a fascinating contest. Rangers have had the better of Celtic since Graham Souness took over just a year ago, a year ago next week, in fact. They've met five times. Rangers are unbeaten. And as you said, they only have to remain unbeaten in this game tomorrow. I think they'll play for a draw, and I think they'll get it. So where do you think the vital areas are going to be tomorrow afternoon, then? Well, I think both sides are scoring goals. Uh, Rangers are losing half the amount of goals Celtic are in the championship race. You only have to look at the league table to see that. I think the Rangers' defence uh, will carry them through. We saw Terry Butcher there. He's a, a magnificent season. I think he'll be in the running for Player uh, of the Year awards. Uh, Chris Woods has been a marvellous goalkeeper for them. And, of course, Graham Roberts is there now. And the fact that they have that rock-solid defence, I think that's a crucial area. But, Jerry, if Rangers do lose, is it not the case that uh, they might suffer the heart syndrome of last year and, and falter at the final hurdle? Well, that's always possible in an old firm match. Anything can happen. But I think the experience of these players, they spent over £2 million on them. I think the experience will carry them through this one. Your tip? I'm going for a draw. I think that'll be enough for Rangers. Very briefly, Jerry. other important games, of course, on tomorrow. Hearts, Hibs and the Clyde Bank Falkirk match in the bottom of the league. How do you see those going? Maltonekis are, are, are certainly on the way out and uh, so are Falkirk, unfortunately, for them. Hibs, do you see them ending that eight-year run? I don't think so. I don't think so. But, uh, as I say, Alec MacDonald and his men uh, have the Indian sign over Hibs. They'll get through tomorrow. Jerry, thanks very much. Well, very briefly, if you fancy a flutter on the Grand National tomorrow, impeccable sources assure me plundering will romp home with Dark Ivy in hot pursuit. So, bookmakers, beware. Don's tips on how to spend your Saturday sixpence. Well, talking of adversaries... It of Scotland's Triple Crown chances in rugby and what could be the Premier League decider at Parkhead... Here's Bill McFarlane. First football and the extraordinary demand for tickets to witness the old firm league showdown at Parkhead has led to a, an increased security operation. Strathclyde police have information that Rangers fans have been buying tickets for the Celtic enclosures and a warning that fans in the wrong part of the ground will be thrown out. Rangers fans queued overnight for the 1,500 tickets sold at Ibrox earlier this week. The club had been allocated 18,000 for the match, but the vast majority of these were distributed through Ibrox season ticket holders and supporters clubs. Strathclyde police say Rangers fans have been joining the queues for Celtic tickets, but any Ibrox fans appearing in the wrong part of tomorrow's 61,000 capacity crowd will be ejected by the reinforced police contingent which will be patrolling the Parkhead game. This is what the excitement's all about, the League Championship trophy, which Rangers are favourites to win for the first time this decade. If they do clinch it, the results of earlier Old Firm matches will be the difference between the great rivals. That's it. It's there. Clark, the 
has scored for Rangers. Ooh, it's there. Number two. We know what kind of, the kind of game it's going to be. It's always a hectic first 15 minutes and all for him tie. There's going to be a full house here tomorrow. It's a lot at stake. We know if we play to our capabilities, we'll win the match. It's our home tie and we'll be looking to take the game to Rangers. But the nine-year league famine at Ibrox has created a hunger for victory. Well, a lot of the players we have here are uh, desperate for success. Uh, they want the success. Everybody at the club wants it. So I don't think uh, in that department will be let down. Tomorrow, Celtic will be looking to top scorer Brian McClare to stifle that Ibrox ambition. <laughs> Meanwhile, Scotland trot out. <laughs> I mean, the thing after the match was, of course, everybody was saying how, you know, offside goals and, you know, we're clutching yeah. at straws again. But I think if, if we look at the goals, Jim, you know, yeah. you'll, we'll see that they weren't offside. But one point I would like to make, certainly about the proved again, Jim, that he wasn't <laughs> offside. I mean, as I say, we are clutching at straws. Yeah, you and, are, really. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, right. a sad, it's a sad day for Scottish football. Yeah. Though. So it looks as if it's a World Cup. <laughs> the World, the World Cup, Cup, Cup yeah. starts now. 1998. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe Dundee United in midweek when ah, they play. Mitch and Gladbach might give us something to hope. smile about. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Celtic versus Rangers for the, really, I think, Jim, for the championship as far as Rangers are concerned. Yeah. Enjoying us from Parkhead, the Celtic manager, David Hay. Good morning, David. Hello, yeah. Or good afternoon, as it is now. Well, it's cold, anyway. Yeah, yeah, how are you feeling? Yeah, a bit blowing, a bit windy, but apart from that, looking forward to the match. Well, it's nice to see it dry up there in Glasgow. It's pouring the rain here in London. Yeah, it's threatening a bit, but it's staying dry just now. Now, let's have a look at the table, David. Really and truly, you've got to win this one, haven't you? Well, a winner bust for us, because basically yeah. Rangers four points clear, better goal difference, and I think unless we won today, they would be favourites for the championship. Yeah, I would think so. Now, what, what is your team? What is your line-up today? Is Mo Johnson playing? Well, I announced a pool of 15 and I'll give out the team just before 2 o'clock. Uh -huh. yeah. well, because little Mo hasn't been playing, has he? You've, you left him out the last couple of weeks. Yeah, he was left out and he was suspended for a week. He came back in the bench last week, come on the last 15 minutes, and uh, hopefully he'll produce it in the part today if selected. Yeah. Now, you've only had one point out of Rangers this season, haven't you? That's true. Uh, the two games at Ibrox, they won well. The draw at Celtic Park, possibly, we might have got a victory in the League Cup. Final was slightly controversial, yeah. cost me a few quid, and possibly could have gone either way. Yeah, yeah. this is a game at uh, Parkhead, isn't it? When you oh, got yes, that yeah. draw, yeah, Brian McCoy scoring there, yeah. yes, and then Ali McCoy scored in the second half. Yeah, we've got Ali McCoy coming up, I think, scoring jubilation by everybody. The, the, the thing down here, David, that uh, it's no jubilation by everybody, Jimmy. <laughs> well, no, I, yeah. I, I would agree with you there, obviously. The, the thing that's of interest down here, David, naturally, is that, uh, you know, Graham Souness has gone there. He's introduced a lot of English players. Uh, and what are your feelings? Are, are you tempted to do the same or what? Well, obviously, it's, in, it's improved Rangers. They've got quality players like Terry Butcher, Graham Roberts and Chris Woods and Graham himself. And that's why they are top of the league just now. We have tried since the turn of the year to sign a few players, a few down south, but it hasn't materialised. So, in the close season, we may do something there. Well, you're definitely looking into this part of the world, are you? Yeah, looking everywhere, Jimmy, to yeah. be honest with you, but have been looking down south. Yeah, good. We've got a Mo Johnson goal uh, for you to look at, David. Well, was when was that? <laughs> this might influence you into picking him this afternoon, Dave. You never know. Yeah. I mean, he's been a good player for you, hasn't he? Oh, Mo's a top-class player. Yeah. But the thing about it is, David, he said he wants to leave at the end of the season. You know, he said he wouldn't mind coming back to England. And I don't think he's even wanting to come back to England. He's got notions of going abroad, Has but uh -huh. as yet we've not done inquiries. Uh -huh. Well, Charlie Nicholas says he might be interested in going up to join you, David. Uh... Okay, I think that's a bit unfair, Jimmy. I think he'll be most in, more interested in trying to win a little Woods Cup medal tomorrow. Did you? Uh -huh. well, there's a lot in the papers that says that. Never he's... believe what you read in the papers, Jimmy. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I have him write, written in papers. I don't, obviously. <laughs> I mean, why would I believe what I read myself? Exactly, yeah. Jimmy. But uh, any interest in him? Would you like him as a matter of interest? Oh, I couldn't really say that would be unfair no? to George Graham and Arsenal. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I mean, he, he, he was a good player for Celtic. Oh, he was a top he class player with uh -huh. Celtic. Scored 50 odd goals in his last season here. Uh -huh. But to be honest with you, Mo Johnson is still a Celtic player, and uh -huh. it could be the same case next season yeah. if no one comes for him. Okay. Well, good luck today, David. You know I've Thanks tipped you. you for the championship. Well, I hope your tips right. Okay, yeah. sir. Thanks for joining us, David. Okay, Jimmy. Okay. Pleasure to speak to you, mate. Lovely. So that should be a cracker to you. I shall yeah. watch that coming in here in the studios this afternoon. Yes, be lovely. indeed. So, the league positions look like this tonight. With Rangers still in top, they're still two points in front, and they're seven goals to the better. 
So it's going to be a very exciting finish, with Rangers still having to play Clyde Bank, Hearts, Dundee, Aberdeen and St Mirren, and Celtic, Hibs, Dundee United, St Mirren, Falkirk and Hearts. Now then, if you're a Dundee United supporter, you're obviously disappointed in that result today, but some comforting news for you. The opponents in the UEFA Cup semi-final on Wednesday night, Borussia Mönchengladbach, lost today to Eintracht by four goals to nothing. With Rangers. That's quite remarkable after last Saturday, really, isn't it? I think David Haney's men have got to realise they can draw level, but they also need goals. They're trailing Rangers by seven goals at the moment. Goal difference won the league for Celtic last season. They've got to go out and try and hammer hips tomorrow. That won't be easy, but they have a target to achieve. Do you think if Celtic win tomorrow, Jerry, that will put any degree of extra pressure on Rangers to perform well next week against Dundee in midweek? I think so. And of course, if the, the cup game goes to replay tomorrow, Rangers have to wait till next Saturday to play against Clyde Bank. So the pressure's obviously building in Rangers now. I think they thought they had the league one last week. It didn't work out for them, and the pressure definitely built at this stage. News from the South tonight. Char Charlie Nicholas has been offered a new contract by Arsenal and it's worth a fair bit of money to Nicholas. Now, obviously, that will disappoint Celtic fans. That's right. I think a few Celtic fans thought he was coming back. He has a business interest in the city. But uh, it must be big money because Charlie was in £2,400 a week and uh, Arsenal would have to match that, at least match that, for any new contract. I can't see any club here paying that kind of money. It's bad news for Scottish football because Charlie's a character. I think we'd like to see him back here in any colour of jersey. He's an entertainer, but Arsenal have him. It looks as though he'll stay there. Sadly, sadly, it looks as though he'll stay there. Jerry, thanks. Uh, we've got the pictures here now. Looking at this, Jim, uh, you know, cast your mind back and see what you think yourself. I'd say they were getting good gates then as well, Jim. Yeah, we were, weren't we? Yeah. I don't know, I took the corner, Ian, and as you can see, brilliantly taken, swung in below the crossbar, and I thought I'd scored it. But obviously, Irvin Scholar thinks otherwise, and quite honestly, I'm not going to disagree with Irvin Scholar because he might have to give me a couple of free tickets one of these days when I ask him. And he's never liked me since I laughed when he got one of those questions wrong in that mastermind the other month. Well, Jim, I mean, being unbiased and looking at that, I thought actually Billy Richard, the goalkeeper, palmed it in, yeah. which means that it's your goal. Yes. You know, yeah. and I know you're sitting there and obviously modesty prevails, but... I mean, look at how can Evan Scholar say that that wasn't your goal? I can't believe it. I, I, I mean, I must admit, I thought I'd scored that night. That's all I can uh -huh. say. But if Irvin deems it to be uh, um, a goal scored by John White, who am I to argue yeah. with the chairman of Tottenham? Well, we, we've shown millions of people today, you know, that goal. And uh, I, for one, think that Greavesy scored it. I think it's 45. And Clive, old son, I think you need another goal to equal the record. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, we'll have another look at today's Spurs in a moment. Now, Rangers Celtic last week. There you are. What do you think of this? If Arts Deacon dips oh, in between dear. Woodsy, the English goalkeeper, yeah. and knocks the ball in the net. Oh, dear. Make oh, dear. it 3-1. Yeah, but that was a strange, strange effort, that really, wasn't it? Because if you looked at that, Woodsy was at fault, McNichol was at fault, <laughs> the referee was at fault, weren't they? Because they... <coughs> And the only fellow who, who did well was your Archdeacon. And he's entitled to. Someone up there must like him. That's for sure. Right, OK. Well, that's it for this week. Don't Bayern play. Munich went into their home leg with Real Madrid with their coach seeking a five-goal advantage. Argenthaler got the Germans off to a good start with their first in the 11th minute. And on the half hour, they scored a second. And in a manner which primed the fuse for an explosive evening. The referee, Bob Valentine of Scotland, saw Boyo's challenge to take the ball away from Dorfner as a penalty. Germany's new national skipper, Lothar Matthias, scored from the spot. Before half-time, though, he collected a booking which removes him from the second leg and had his face stepped on by Juanito, who departed, sent off from the first. By the time the others had joined him in the dressing room, the Germans had a third goal, scored by Volpart, and the coach, Udo Latek, was ecstatic. It didn't last. Three minutes after the restart, Putragenio scored for Real. And German fears of the usual Spanish revival in the second leg came flooding back. They had the chance to remove them when Real were down to nine men for the last 15 minutes. and couldn't add to a fourth goal, given them with a wave of the hand by the soon-to-depart Mino. Matthias scored from the spot again, but the final outcome is still clouded. Paolo Futra was the local hero of the other semi, but look carefully, did he really score this goal? Porto won, but only 2-1, and Dynamo Kiev should make it to the final.
In the Cup Winners' Cup, Sosa of Zaragoza scored first, but Ajax of Amsterdam beat them 3-2 on a soggy Spanish ground. Or, put it another way, they took them to the cleaners. And if mud in Spanish eyes proved too literal, what can be said for the taste of a previously rated Bordeaux? Richter, and then Brido following up, proved too much for Dropsy, and locomotive Leipzig raised their glasses to a 1-0 away win. Meanwhile, Spanish lenses were honing in on Gothenburg's celebrations, begun in the 29th minute by Glenn Heysen in their UEFA Cup meeting with Austria's Tyrol. Nielsen put Anderson through for a second just five minutes later. But the party suddenly went very quiet when just on half-time, from their first attack of any note, Peter Packelt found an excellent finish for the Austrians. Nielsen, starting a major match for the first time, quickly restored the atmosphere in the second half as the Austrian offside trap fell in pieces. And then Tyrol gave away a fourth, an own goal by Kalinic. Gothenburg have now played 22 UEFA games over the last seven years without losing. Well, that's the European scene. We said we'd tell you about any news we had from Villa Park, which we don't. Still no decision on whether it's uh, Gary Plumley or Steve Sherwood. We'll let you know. We think it'll be a very late decision there. Well, as well as cup finals, end of seasons usually provide a crop of uh, smash hit singles from footballers. A couple on release already. Spurs, Hoddle and Waddle, alias Glenn and Chris. They have their names in lights. Chris and Glenn there, and in Liverpool, football's answer to George Martin. Craig Johnson has written and produced The Pride of Mer